Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's panel discussion entitled The Nazi Rise to Power and the Weimar Constitution. My name is Melissa Fleming, and I'm the Undersecretary General for Global Communications at the United Nations. Today's program is organized by the Holocaust and the United Nations Outreach Program and the International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists. We acknowledge their support, as well as the support of our co-sponsors, the permanent missions of Germany and Israel to the United Nations. I hope that many of you were able to watch the beautiful uh, UN virtual observance yesterday of the International Day of Commemoration in memory of the victims of the Holocaust. Today's program is also part of the events organized in the observance of this day. We have with us a distinguished panel. They will consider the factors that facilitated the Nazis rise to power in Germany, and particularly the role played by the legal system and infrastructure in Weimar era Germany. The period following the First World War and before the coming to power in Germany of the National Socialist Party, the Nazi Party in 1933, is sometimes overshadowed by the horrors that followed during the Holocaust. Yet, if we want to understand more about why the Holocaust happened, we have to consider the context in which the Nazi Party rose to power. We have to ask, how is it possible that a country with a constitution that was arguably among the most progressive in the world during the 1920s, should see the rise of a party based on an extremist and deeply anti-democratic ideology of racism, anti-Semitism, and intolerance. What were the factors that fatally weakened the democracy of the Weimar Republic? Is there relevance in this history to democracies in the 21st century? Our distinguished panelists who will examine these questions are Sherry Berman, Professor of Political Science at Barnard College, Columbia University, Benjamin Hett, Professor of History at Hunter College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, Douglas G. Morris, legal historian, author, and practicing criminal defense attorney, and Herlinda Power Studer, Professor of Practical Philosophy and Ethics in the Department of Philosophy. University of Vienna. We encourage you to send us your questions for these panelists using the Q&A function in this platform. Please include your name and affiliation. Our guests will take your questions right after their presentations. If time allows, we will also have a general Q&A at the end. Please note that the event is being recorded and we will share the recording with all registered participants afterwards. Our co-organizer today, the International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists, is also known as IGL, IJL. Its membership uh, comprises lawyers and jurists in more than 50 countries. IJL is, a, is an accredited NGO with the UN's Economic and Social Council. It is now my pleasure to call on Mayor Linson, the president of IJL, to deliver our welcoming remarks. Over to you. Your Excellencies, dear speakers, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mayor Linsen and I am the President of the International Association of Jewish Lawyer and Jurist IJL and also a son of Holocaust survivors. Our organization was established in 1969 by three prominent uh, Jewish advocates, Justice Chaim Cohen of the Israeli Supreme Court, Justice Arthur Goldberg of the US Supreme Court and René Cassin, the 1968 Nobel Peace Prize lawyer. It is their legacy to fight anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial, and gross human rights violation that we carry with us on a day-to-day -day basis. Unfortunately, atrocities still take place in the world, and the IGL will continue to use its resources to stand against any situation anti-Semitism, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and other human rights violations. I am the son of Holocaust survivors who lost a significant part of their families in the awful war. My late mother, 
Ita Linse, Ney Weissmann, survived both Auschwitz and Birkenbeck. I'm very proud to be the head of the International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists. I'm honored that our organization is holding this event, an important date of collaboration with the United Nations and Holocaust Outreach Program, co-sponsored by the German and the Israeli missions to the United Nations in Europe. The event today marks the International Holocaust Remember States. Fighting Holocaust denial and ensure the memory of Holocaust is an important task that we proudly undertake. And I would like to commend the United Nations and the Holocaust Outreach Program for their remarkable work in this regard. The event today, titled The Nazi Rise of Power and the Weimar Constitution, is focused on historical and legal perspective of the way that existing democratic legal framework enabled to rise to power the cruelest and the inhuman regime in modern human history. This must remind us that the law is a very sensitive tool that requires different checks and balances to prevent any severe misuses. The International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists holds to be part of its mandate to preserve and implement such checks and balances and to ensure that human rights are maintained. I would like to send to thank the speakers of this event. The permanent representative of Israel to the United Nations in New York, Mr. Gilad Ortan. The permanent representative of Germany to the UN in New York, His Excellency Christoph Husken for Gospels in the UN. And uh, the Under Secretary General for Global Communication, Mrs. Melissa Fleming. Special thanks uh, to the expert speakers of this event, Professor Sherry Bellman, Professor Benjamin Head, uh, Mr. Douglas Morris, and Professor Helen Power Studer. Lastly, I would like to pay gratitude to those who worked hard to make this event. Dr. Tracy Peterson, manager of the United Nations and the Holocaust Outreach Program, and Mrs. Olga Eskevich of the United Nations and Holocaust Outreach Program. Also, I would like uh, to thank people from my organization, Mr. Richard Horowitz, Mr. Mrs. Regina Tapuchi, and Mr. Afram Tsu. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'm now very pleased to invite the permanent representative of Germany to the United Nations, His Excellency, Mr. Christoph Heusken, to take the floor. The floor is yours, Excellency. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa. And uh, thank you for inviting me as the representative of Germany to the United Nations uh, to join you for today's event. Um, it is uh, my honor to um, give some opening remarks before the discussion on um, legal structures, Weimar democracy and the rise to power of the Nazis. And I would like to congratulate you on the wonderful um, panelists that you have assembled and I'm looking very much forward to the, to the discussion. Um, I'm um, glad to be able to open this event together with my colleague uh, Gilad Erdan from uh, the Israeli mission. Germany carries a historical responsibility and uh, this responsibility will never lessen. Furthermore, this responsibility does not end with uh, simply pledging for a never again, uh, but has to include active measures to combat all forms of anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. Germany is committed to this fight through a variety of initiatives, not only here at the United Nations, um, but also as current president of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance or during our EU presidency in the second half of 2020. For me, the fight against anti-Semitism includes a look back, um, but also an active commitment in the present and our common future. Reviewing the uh, legal framework that helped to pave the way for the egregious crimes of the Nazi regime enabled us to prevent similar catastrophes in the future. The Spanish philosopher George Santayana and later Winston Churchill said, quote, 
those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it, end quote. Indeed, recent events have shown us that we cannot take democracy for granted. We must therefore protect and strengthen our liberal democratic values. Otherwise, these structures can be undermined, especially in times of crisis. We need to make sure that our democ democracy is strong. We mark this year's Holocaust Remembrance Day in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. The coronavirus has fundamentally changed our lives over the last few months. While we cannot yet fully comprehend the extent of the multiple social and economic crises brought about the pandemic, we know that they have fueled prejudices and conspiracy myths. This climate may be frighteningly reminiscent of the influence the Weimar Republic was exposed to. A climate in which hate speech and prejudices were able to grow more easily. I assure you that Germany is as committed as ever to combat any form of anti-Semitism and Holocaust distortion or denial. This is also what Germany is trying to achieve within its two-year presidency of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. For example, by our latest project, which was only launched last week and included the publication of recommendations on how to strengthen awareness of Holocaust distortion and ways to better respond to such. I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion and your insights. And again, Melissa, thank you very much for organizing it. And uh, we as uh, Germans always appreciate very much to be included in these discussions. This is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Hoiskin. Um, and I would now like to give the floor to the permanent representative of Israel to the United Nations, His Excellency, Mr. Gilad Menashe Erdan. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you and uh, good day, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our co-sponsors for uh, orga organizing this event, the German mission to the United Nations and my friend, Ambassador Hoisgen, uh, the International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists, and of course, the Holocaust and United Nations uh, Outreach Program. I also want to extend special gratitude to Under Secretary General Melissa Fleming, Mary Linzen, and all of our panelists. Uh, it is vital to commemorate the Holocaust, not only to honor the memory of the victims and those who survived, but to always be reminded that such a terrible event is possible, that humans are capable of such evil, that killing was industrialized, that it was sponsored by a state and not that long ago. We must always look beyond the facade and identify deep rooted racism, hate and bigotry, and we must always fight against them the moment they are found. All four of my grandparents survived the horrors of the Holocaust. After having lost almost uh, all of their families, they rebuilt their lives in Israel. Learning from history and particularly the events leading up to the Holocaust during which the international community, community mostly remained silent and ignored the signs compels us to fulfill the promise of never again. This morning's event is not merely an academic discussion. Understanding the Nazis rise to power by quote unquote legal and democratic means is extremely relevant today as we face intensifying threats from Iran's Ayatollah regime. Our panel today will help the global community identify the warning signs of a regime with genocidal and hege hegemonic ambitions that disguises itself in a cloak of legitimacy. The Iranian regime, like the Nazis, spews poisonous anti-Semitism. Its leaders espouse Holocaust denial and promote the modern form of anti-Semitism, denying the Jewish state's very right to exist. As the Secretary General himself noted, attempts to delegitimize Israel's right to exist, including calls for its destruction, are a clear contemporary manifestation of anti-Semitism. 
Like the Nazis, the Iranian leadership seeks to dominate the entire region. The Ayatollah, the Ayatollahs have used the dividends from the seemingly legitimate and legal 2015 nuclear deal to arm its terrorist proxies throughout the Middle East. And like the Nazis, Iran is attempting to formalize its anti-Semitic plans in so-called legitimate legislative proceedings. A recent bill proposed by the Iranian parliament calls for the destruction of Israel by the year 2041. Such legislation will essentially commit future Iranian regime regimes to follow the fanatical ideology of the current tyrannical government. Ladies and gentlemen, on International Holocaust Remembrance Day, we must dedicate ourselves to assuring that history does not repeat itself. We are currently bearing witness not only to the words and rhetoric of Iran, but to its very real and concrete steps to annihilate the world's only Jewish state. We all know the regime is racing to develop nuclear arms while testing long-range ballistic missiles painted with the slogan, Death to Israel. As on the eve of World War II, the writing is on the wall, and we must not make the mistake of appeasing such a dangerous regime again. Today's presentations are important, not only for Israel's future, but everyone. It is my hope that the international community takes collective action to turn these lessons into decisive action to stop Iran before it is too late. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Erdan. And I would now like to turn to our panelists and introduce our first speaker, Sherry Berman, who is the professor, is a professor of political science at Barnard College at Columbia University. Professor Berman has published extensively on European politics and political development, the left, fascism, uh, populism, and the fate of democracy. Her most recent book is Democracy and Dictatorship from the Ancient Regime to the Present Day. Today, Professor Berman will discuss her conclusion that extremism is a symptom of democratic failure rather than a cause of the failure of democracy. She considers how democratic actors and institutions paved the way for the Nazi rise to power. Dear audience, please remember that you can post your questions for Professor Berman in the chat. She will answer them right after her presentation. Professor Berman, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. I am honored um, to be here. So um, I think we are facing obviously a very critical juncture in world history. In the United States in particular, the Trump presidency and the January 6th insurrection um, along with the rise of right-wing populism more generally, has set off um, a rush to try to understand the causes of the rise of extremism and of democratic decline. And within this, um, within this research agenda or within these questions, obviously comparisons to the interwar years and the rise of fascism has flourished. And so it is particularly apt um, uh, one day after Holocaust Remembrance Day to reconsider the rise of the Nazis and the collapse of the Weimar Republic and see what lessons we can learn from that, um, from that particular case. Um, so the most traditional way of approaching these kinds of questions and issues is by looking at the radicals or the extremists themselves, examining their ideas, their appeals, their actions, and so on. And so from this perspective, understanding the rise of the Nazis, the Nazi party, Hitler's popularity, um, and the collapse of the Weimar Republic means devoting our attention to looking at, again, the ideas that Hitler had, the appeals of the Nazi party, the programs of the Nazi party. Now, of course, this is extremely important, but focusing on these actors themselves, I think often misses the big picture. Um, or to put it another way, the more fundamental causes of democratic collapse need to be understood if we are going to if we are going to devise effective um, responses to democratic decay. 
And so to understand the Nazi rise to power, other cases of interwar fascism, the rise of right wing populism today, I want to focus our attention on how it is that extremists gain the support and power necessary to overthrow democracy. And answering this question requires looking past the ideas, the appeals, and the programs of extremists in general, the Nazis in particular, and instead focusing our attention on the contexts within which these extremists developed. What turned Hitler and the Nazi party from a group of marginal extremists into the rulers of much of Europe was the failure of Weimar's elites and institutions to deal with the crises facing German society during the interwar years. Um, to paraphrase a great quote um, from Karl Marx in his 18th Brumaire of um, Louis Napoleon, men make their own history, but not as they please. They do so in the circumstances given to them. And it is these circumstances that we need to understand if we wanna understand the rise of the Nazis and other extremist movements across any people who are attending this panel know that um, the Nazi party in Germany, fascist movements in interwar Europe more generally, had their origins in the rise of nationalist movements in late 19th century Europe. Now, these nationalist movies varied from place to place, but they shared a couple of key characteristics. They were um, directly opposed to democracy and liberalism. They held a belief that the nation, often defined in religious or racial terms, represented the most important source of identity for citizens, and that leaders and states must therefore protect this nation. Now, these movements became disruptive in many European countries during the late 19th and early 20th century, but they did not fundamentally challenge the existing political order before 1914. Their appeals, their policies, their programs alone, in other words, did not make them truly dangerous or revolutionary. It took the First World War to make that happen. The First World War, of course, maimed, killed, and traumatized millions of Europeans. It physically and economically devastated much of the continent. And making matters worse, the end of the war did not bring any relief, but instead ushered in a period of immense social and economic difficulties. Despite this, however, in the initial post-World War I period, fascists remained marginal. In Italy, the fascists received very few, very few votes in uh, the country's first post-war elections. And in Germany, a wide variety of right-wing insurrectionists, including uh, Hitler and his Nazi party, um, engaged in uprisings against the Weimar Republic, including the infamous 1923 Beer Hall Putsch that failed. They were not able to overthrow democracy in Germany. However, as time passed, the problems facing the Weimar Republic and other interwar democratic regimes mounted and democratic elites and institutions proved unable to deal with them. Hyperinflation in Germany in the 1920s, um, and the Weimar Republic had barely, of course, recovered from this hyperinflation when the Great Depression hit in the early 1930s. Now, it's important to note that the great, by the time the Great Depression had hit, faith in democracy in Germany was already declining, right? And we can see this most obviously in the collapse of support for center parties in Weimar during the 1920s. But it's important to note that in the last election before the depression really began to hurt, that is in 1928, the Nazi party had still only received about two and a half percent of the vote. But then the depression hits and the dam of democratic dissatisfaction that had been growing broke. Now what proved so catastrophic about the depression in Germany and elsewhere was not merely the economic suffering that it caused, but the failure of democratic elites and parties and institutions to deal with it. And we can see this in a comparison between Germany and the US, right? These are the two countries that were hardest hit by the depression with the highest unemployment rates, um, largest rates of business collapse, yada, yada, yada. Now in the United States, this economic suffering did propel, right? The popularity of pseudo 
fascist leaders like the Louisiana politician Huey Long and the radio preacher Father Cochran. But certainly American democracy was longer lived and more deeply rooted than the Weimar Republic was. But a key reason why these movements, these figures did not gain more popularity was the actions of FDR himself. Roosevelt clearly recognized that if the depression was not forcefully dealt with, threats to democracy would increase. He accordingly promised a new deal for the American people that would address the economic suffering and show that the government could address the needs of the country. In Germany, on the other hand, Weimar governments did little to address either the immediate suffering or the long-term causes of the depression. In fact, during the 1930s, um, governments pursued austerity policies in response to the depression, which merely exacerbated the economic suffering. Even the main opposition party, the Social Democratic Party, um, offered little in the way of an attractive alternative program to deal with the depression. This, of course, left the field open for the Nazis who were able to take advantage of the declining faith in democracy and the suffering of the depression to attack Weimar, right? The Nazi party criticized democracy as inefficient, unresponsive and weak, which it certainly looked like during the 1930s. It promised to replace it with a system that would end unemployment, use the state to protect citizens from capitalism, eliminate unscrupulous capitalists, of course, often Jews, and who would um, devote the government to protecting the people from all of its enemies. And the Nazi vote exploded from about two and a half percent in 1928 to 18 percent in 1930 to 33% in 1932, the last truly free elections um, uh, in the Weimar Republic's history. But it's important to note that even with this, the Nazis did not take power on their own. They needed the support of conservatives who worked behind the scene to get the president Hindenburg to appoint Hitler as chancellor. And from there, of course, um, the rest is history. So let me just step back for my last minute or so and. Um, try to provide what I think are some lessons from the Nazi rise to power. Um, first, as the title of the talk says, I think it is best to consider extremism as a symptom of democratic decline rather than a cause of it. Hitler could not take power in 1930, 1923 when he tried. Mussolini could not take power in 19. 19 after the First World War. And if either Hitler or Mussolini had been born in the United States, they would have remained historical footnotes. That is because, again, returning to that uh, famous quote from Marx, circumstances matter more. Circumstances matter more than the ideas, the appeals, and the programs of particular political actors. Those seeking to overthrow democracy can only succeed when enough people have become dissatisfied to consider supporting anti-democratic politicians and parties, or even engaging in anti-democratic insurrectionary behavior themselves. Small d, not big D, small d Democrats have to lose the game, in other words, before extremists like the Nazis can win it. Um, so let me end by saying, therefore, that if we want to prevent the rise of extremism in the future, which is obviously um, one of the goals of this panel, right, to engage in discussions about how we can prevent tragedies like the collapse of the Weimar Republic, right, we need to focus as much attention on revitalizing or strengthening democracy itself. We have to be conscious of its fragility, not just in places like interwar Germany, but in places like the United States today. We have to spend as much time thinking about democracy as we do about extremists themselves. We need to strengthen democracy's immune system, if I may use a COVID era analogy, so that even when extremists arise, as they always do, right, throughout history, they are not able to gain the nourishment or support that they need to actually be able to threaten democracy over the long term. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, I'm I'm seeing a, a number of uh, I'm seeing three questions in the Q and A, but they sound um, very 
general, uh, and I think I might reserve them for the general Q&A, except the one that just came in, which is um, what conditions would have made it possible for Weimar to have survived? I think that would be one for you. To so that's a great question, and it's a very big one. Um, uh, I would say that starting in the if we work our way backwards from the depression, I think by the time we get to the depression in Germany, the Weimar Republic has been very seriously weakened. But it seems to me quite possible that if you had had a strong democratic coalition that supported policies akin to what we saw in the United States or places like Sweden, that you might very well have avoided that final collapse and appointment of Hitler. Um, there were indeed people advocating for that kind of thing in Germany, but for a variety of reasons, they were rejected by different actors, including perhaps most tragically, the Social Democratic Party itself. I think you might very well have gotten a continued conservative slide into some form of authoritarianism in Germany, but avoiding the Nazi takeover of power, I think might very well have been possible. An upturn happens in Germany, just as it happens in the United States soon after Hitler comes to power. And he gains an enormous amount of legitimacy from Germany's economic recovery. If that last endgame of the Weimar Republic might uh, went differently, I think we might very well, it's very hard to tell, of course, with history, have avoided, again, um, Hitler uh, coming to power. I'm going to throw you a very... Um perhaps philosophical question that came from Linda Hackner from Cape Town, South, South Africa, and she asks, where does enlightenment fit in with the growth of nationalism? Okay, so that is also a giant question. I mean, nationalism is a product of um, the modern era, just like all of the other great things that we think about it, like, uh, you know, like democracy, it has its first major manifestation coming out of the French Revolution. But there are good and bad things about nationalism, just like there are good and bad things about many other political phenomena. Nationalism is what enables nations to sort of come together and provide unprecedented goods for their citizens, um, welfare, security, all of these other things. But in in its bad forms, it can also be a way to separate people from one another, to justify in and out group behavior, violence against people who are seen as threats. So I think we have to understand nationalism as something that has had incredibly positive effects during the modern era, right, as an indirect, perhaps, product of the Enlightenment, but also one with some very serious potential downsides. Yeah, and indeed we're experiencing this now with the COVID crisis and the need for nationalism when it comes to protecting people against the spread of the virus, but the need for um, the need for multilateralism when it comes to protecting us all. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for those remarks, Professor Berman. Uh, our next speaker is Benjamin Hett, Professor of History at Hunter College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. A qualified lawyer, Professor Hett is also an accomplished author. His works have blended German history with legal themes and include Crossing Hitler, The Man Who Put the Nazis on the Witness Stand, a biography of the courageous anti-Nazi lawyer Hans Litten. Professor Hett's work explores the rise of the Nazis and the coming of the Second World War. His book, Death of Democracy, examines why democracy failed in Germany in the early 1930s. And his book, The Nazi Menace, examines the coming of the Second World War. Today, Professor Hett's talk is entitled, Thou Shalt Not Rest Judgment, Legal Irrationality, Political Legitimacy, and the Rise of the Nazis. We very much look forward to your input, Professor Hett. The floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I am really honored to be able to be a part of this uh, panel today. And uh, thanks to all concerned, the IJL, the Israeli and German missions and Under Secretary General Fleming and everyone at the UN. Okay, so in the early 1930s, Peter Drucker, who at the time was a young reporter, later famous as a writer on business management, 
watched a Nazi politician speaking to a crowd. We don't want higher bread prices, the speaker proclaimed. We don't want lower bread prices. We don't want bread prices to remain the same. By now, his audience might have been very puzzled about the program, but then he added a key point of explanation. We want national socialist bread prices. It seems to me that this nameless Nazi speech offers a crucial insight into the politics of late Weimar and probably the politics of most other times and places too. It's pure tribalism. It doesn't matter what the policy is. It doesn't matter what the rational merits or demerits of the policy might be. All that matters is that we make the policy. You may wonder what this has to do with law and legal thinking in late Weimar and the rise of the Nazis. The answer, I think, is quite a lot, and let me explain why. Tucked away in the Nazi party's official 25-point program was point number 19, the drift of which probably seemed very odd to many people then and since, and I'm quoting here, we demand the replacement of Roman law, which serves a materialistic world order with German common law. This point alluded to a long-standing argument in German law. Over centuries, many scholars and lawgivers of various kinds had worked to organize German law according to the intellectual concepts and categories descended from Justinian's codification of Roman law, an effort that had culminated at the end of the 19th century in the production of sophisticated and elaborate German legal codes. Codification was very much a project of the Enlightenment, you know, referring back to that question. Uh, Romanized and codified law was to be clear, rational, modern, and of course just, and enable precise and definitive answers to any legal question. The predictability and rationality of Germany's legal order was policed by a provision in the criminal code derived from the biblical injunction, thou shalt not rest judgment, that's in the King James translation. In Luther's Bible, this came out as du sollst das Recht nicht beugen, or you shall not bend the law. And so Rechtbeugung, or bending the law, became an offense a judge or other official could be found guilty of if their verdict demonstrably deviated from the clear requirements of the code. But there was a very different way to think about law. In the early 19th century, the historical school had arisen in Germany as a reaction against all that enlightening and rationalizing and codifying. The historical school had it that law should bubble up organically from the people, just like language. No Romanized or Frenchified law could serve Germans, just as Germans should not speak Latin or French. Law thought about in this way was not rational or predictable and was not supposed to be. It was simply supposed to serve the people. Or to put it in terms of Drucker's Nazi politician, what matters about law is that it be made by us. The Nazis were heirs to this way of thinking about law, hence Article 19 of their program. Not that this romantic, irrationalist version of law had to stand on the political right. It didn't. What was clear, however, was that it was very likely to stand in opposition to the state and to the existing legal order. Americans might be surprised to know that many of the basic ideas in our debates now about how to interpret the Constitution were born in Germany over 100 years ago. There was, for instance, a movement called the Free Law School, prominently represented by a young legal scholar and historian named Hermann Kantorowicz. As the rather hippie sounding name suggests, the Free Law School was a romantic and rebellious reaction that had it the judges should be free to fling their own thing and do with a case what seems spontaneously right, not necessarily what the formal code required. In the years around 1900, this was a liberal and left-wing movement against the strictures of the mildly authoritarian imperial German state. There were other movements of similar kind, such as the sociological jurisprudence of Eugen Ehrlich. These movements are, by the way, the ancestors for law geeks of American legal realism and virtually all the intellectual currents in American law since the 1920s. The really interesting thing for Germany is that after 1918, when Germany became a democracy with a constitution drafted by liberal law professors, 
the whole argument flipped. The logic was still the same. On one side, you had the state and its codes of law, the criminal code, the civil code, above all, the constitution, guarded against abuse by that criminal code provision of bending the law. On the other side, you had opponents of the state bearing legal doctrines that argued for freer and looser interpretations of positive law. It's just that now those advocates of free and loose interpretation came from the right, including the far right, because it was the liberals who had the state and the laws. Hermann Kantorowicz, pre-war advocate of free law, shifted over to a position of strict constructionalism or what we call legal positivism. In the Weimar Republic, the Democrats were mostly all legal positivists, not the right. Flip through the pages of the very right-wing German judges news, Deutsche Richterzeitung, and you will find articles with titles like Judicial Correction of Obsolete Laws, 1930, or Does Supralegal Equal Illegal, 1932, in which a judge, judge argued that, to quote, what is legal in the individual case should be derived from the generally valid legal order that is imminent in every social situation but which only finds a limited expression in any written law. Without any doubt, the most consequential right-wing legal thinker of the Weimar Republic and the transition to Nazism was Karl Schmitt. And Karl Schmitt's ideas closely embody what we have been talking about here. He preached the idea of decisionism, as he explained it, and I'm quoting here from Karl Schmitt, the sovereign decision is therefore legally derived neither from a norm nor from a concrete order itself, nor within the frame of a concrete order, because to the contrary, for the decider, the decision itself is the basis for the norm as for the order. The sovereign decision is the absolute beginning and the beginning is nothing other than the sovereign decision. So just as Drucker's Nazi politician might've put it and to translate out of somewhat windy philosophical German, what matters is who decides on the bread prices and that they are deciding on the bread prices, not what the bread prices are. So what does this mean for the Nazi seizure and consolidation of power and the role that law played in these processes? Schmidt contributed decisively to the erosion of Weimar parliamentary democracy in the years after 1929, an important prequel to Hitler's accession to power, as Professor Berman explained. He had worked out a theory that the Weimar Constitution could really be re reduced to the articles giving crucial powers to the president of the Reich, whom Schmidt deemed the guardian of the Constitution. Article 48 gave the president, uh, the president sweeping emergency powers, a provision which Schmidt built into an entirely separate edifice of government. It is, he said, the person who decides on the exception who is truly sovereign, and he devised a whole theory of rule based on the power to make exceptional decisions in an emergency. Less well known is that Schmidt also based this authority on Article 42 of the Constitution, which assigned the president the duty of keeping the German people safe from harm. Schmidt used this power to justify overriding any other section of the Constitution. Schmidt devised these ideas while serving as counsel to the two administrations before Hitler's, right-wing and anti-democratic governments, but not Nazis. These ideas, especially as applied by the crafty political general Kurt von Schleicher, resulted in Germany moving in 1930, three years before Hitler came to the chancellorship, from being a parliamentary democracy to a kind of informal dictatorship based on Schmidt's interpretation of the presidential powers. But Schmidt enthusiastically applied his doctrines to Hitler's government as well, and the Nazis enthusiastically adopted them. Let me illustrate the point by giving one example which really sums up everything I've been saying. On June 30th, 1934, there occurred the infamous Night of the Long Knives, actually several days of murder of selected political opponents explicitly ordered by Hitler with no pretense of judicial process. In an essay published a few weeks later entitled, The Führer Protects the Law, Schmidt praised Hitler for his adherence to, to quote, a substantive law that is not cut off from morality and justice, as opposed to the empty fidelity to statute 
and untruthful neutrality of the Weimar system. When Hitler ordered the killings of June 30th, said Schmidt, he had been protecting the law. And to quote again from Schmidt, from Hitler's Führership flows his judgeship. Now, you might be excused for thinking that a judge who orders a mass of summary murders without going through the elaborate trial and pretrial process specified in the German Code of Criminal Procedure was committing bending of the law if ever anyone had. But this too is a good part of the point. The offense of bending the law innocently assumes that correct legal answers are easily and self-evidently to be read from statutory enactments. Schmidt and the Nazis had nothing but scorn for such a view. Schmidt was, of course, intellectually much more sophisticated than the Nazi politician with whom we started, the one talking about National Socialist bread prices. But the basic point is exactly the same. Tribalism wins over rationality, and tribalism becomes the essential source of political legitimacy. Schmidt himself wrote that Hitler's Führer power and judicial power were both ultimately anchored in the people's right to existence, and this made them law. At the moment, in January in the year 2021, as we observe remembrance of the Holocaust, just weeks after rioters in the U.S. Capitol yelled, this is our house, some of them wearing t-shirts emblazoned with the words Camp Auschwitz or six million was not enough, Schmidt's words should give us some very sobering food for thought. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, ben, Benjamin Het. And I, we have a number of um, questions here that are also very general, but maybe I'll, I'll pose one of them, or maybe one or two of them to you. Sure. Um, one person is asking, do you think history has been too kind to some key members of the Weimar Republic who had an obligation to strengthen German democracy? and underestimated the rise of Hitler, what responsibility do they bear? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. And actually, if you read any historian um, writing about the end of the Weimar Republic, you will find different villains, really. Uh, uh, but there are certain who recur. And for my money, there are maybe two who stand out um, as, as for people who should have defended the order and didn't. Um, Professor Berman mentioned the Social Democrats who, who could have done more. They were in a tricky position, but I think, for my money, the real guilt focuses on a man named Franz von Papen, who was chancellor for a while in 1932, and then through some really complicated maneuverings, mostly out of his own spite and jealousy, um, helped maneuver Hitler into the chancellorship early in 1933. He bears a very heavy load of responsibility, as does the Reich president, Paul von Hindenburg, um, World War I commander and president since 1925, who really just wanted a right-wing government, however undemocratic, so he could relax and not have to work very hard. And he was willing to accept any right-wing government, even ultimately one led by Hitler, um, as the price of him having a quiet life and securing his reputation and not having to deal with pesky social democrats, basically. Right. Well, you answered another question that somebody posed, which was how did Hindenburg allow Hitler to become the chancellor? So let's move to one more that you kind of touched on. Um, that is, uh, can you envision, this is Ariel uh, Sobelman asking, can you uh, envision any constitutional or legal framework that could hermetically prevent a collapse of democracy? From recent events in the U.S., it seems that even the pen, uh, pedantic perfection of Jefferson et al. Even that was not able to foresee all possible scenarios. Bottom line, can any legal structure ever really prevent democracy or protect democracy? Sorry. And that's another kind of hotly debated question. There's a kind of basic um, argument in sort of legal scholarship. Uh, you know, does law come first or does society come first? Which shapes the other? Um, I'm sort of on the side of society on that one. So my answer for what it's worth uh, is no, uh, there is no specific legal enactment that Carl Schmitt or whomever could not have interpreted their way around in, in, in the crisis after 1930 that, you know, uh, Professor Berman talked about in particular. I think, uh, I th so I, my answer is no. 
Very good. Well, thank you very, very much, Professor Hett. And now it's time to welcome our next panelist, Doug Douglas G. Morris. D Dr. Morris is a legal historian, author, practicing criminal defense attorney, and recipient of the Thurgood Marshall Award from the Association of the Bar of the City of New York for serving as a pro bono counsel to, hu to a human being under a sentence of death. Dr. Morris also holds an MA and a PhD in modern European history from the University of Rochester. He is the author of Justice in Peril, The Anti-Nazi Lawyer, Max Hirschberg in Weimar, Germany, as well as Legal Sabotage, Ernst Frankel in Hitler's Germany. Dr. Morris will speak to us today on the origins of the Nazi dual state of arbitrary power and that Nazified law. We look forward to hearing from you, Dr. Morris. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I am sorry that I entered the uh, sessions late. I don't know if that was noticeable. I had the remote equivalent of getting stuck in the subway as I was trying to get on the computer, uh, but uh, with the help of uh, everybody at the UN, we managed. I appreciate that. Uh, in late July 1936, four years into a legal labor dispute, Germany's Supreme Labor Court heard oral argument in the Delatovsky case. The lawyer Ernst Frankel entered the courtroom. His adversary, Dr. Hermann Meisinger, had already arrived with new co-counsel, and he hurriedly whispered a warning to Frankel, caution, Gestapo. That was a timely warning for any lawyer in Nazi Germany, and especially for Ernst Frankel, a leading labor lawyer, Jewish and Marxist. Cautioned or not, Frankel proceeded with his oral argument. The case involved, involved the Gleichschaltung, that is the enforced Nazification, in 1933 of a cremation society, first called the German Freethinkers Alliance, then renamed the New German Funeral Association. Frankel represented several dismissed employees. They had sued the association for severance pay based on a collective bargaining agreement from 1932, that is from the Weimar era, from before the Gleichschaltung, from before the enforced Nazification. The Nazified Association's defense was that the association did not have to make severance payments because the Nazi state had transformed a formerly Marxist alliance into a new Nazified association. A back and forth then ensued in court between Frankel and the Gestapo lawyer. Frankel argued that the association remained a continuing entity bound by its earlier obligations. The Gestapo lawyer answered, that the association owed nothing to dismissed employees. And the reason was that the old organization had been eradicated and reconstituted into a new one. That is to say that the Nazi state could, simply by its own say-so, dissolve a prior entity and erase its obligations. Frankel objected, the state sovereign act could not create a private organization out of nothing. The Gestapo lawyer countered that the Gestapo could undertake with legal effect everything that appeared to it to be necessary and required. Taken aback, Frankel asked, even dissolve a marriage? The Gestapo lawyer retorted, without doubt. What did Germany's Supreme Labor Court do? The court rendered a decision the same day in favor of the dismissed employees. Frankel had won the case on behalf of his clients. The court reasoned that the Gestapo could accomplish its political goals. It could transform the association's political character and it could still adhere to the association's prior contractual obligations to terminated employees. What did the Gestapo do? 
the Gestapo proceeded to seize the association's assets, to seize the money owed to the dismissed employees. So what had happened in this case? Frankel's procedural success in court had collapsed into ultimate failure in terms of the practical outcome. And this case, the Delatovsky case, helped Frankel to crystallize his thinking about the nature of the Nazi legal political system. Frankel had an epiphany, or as much an epiphany as a Jewish Marxist labor lawyer could have. Consider this moment in late July of 1936. It was three years after Frankel had begun representing political defendants in Nazi era courts. It was one month after the Nazi decree of June 17, 1936, which made Heinrich Himmler the chief of all German police, in addition to his being the head of the SS. Thus, it handed over to the Nazis centralized control of all police power and, taught, and turned all police into potential instruments for carrying out the regime's political purposes. With the Delatovsky case, Frankel realized that the Nazi legal political system had become a dual state. This was a state characterized by the interplay between arbitrary power and a Nazified legal system or a Nazifying legal system. There was arbitrary power when dissatisfied with a judicial decision the Gestapo could unilaterally set it aside. And there was a Nazified legal system. The arbitrary power of the Gestapo not only upended the legal system, it also politicized it. The Delatovsky case itself is a prime example of this dual state. In this case, the Gestapo sent at least three message, messages illustrating the workings of the dual state or the way it created itself. First, the Gestapo sent the message that the Gestapo on occasion might work through the courts. The Gestapo gave the court a chance to decide in its favor. But when the court did not decide in the Gestapo's favor, when the court crossed the Gestapo, then the court put itself at risk. The judiciary could preserve its or could preserve or jeopardize its own legitimacy. Since the Gestapo would win no matter what, the courts faced a choice of ruling for the Gestapo immediately and preserving some of their own legitimacy or ruling against the Gestapo and embarrassingly losing that legitimacy. Therefore, the Gestapo's approach was bound to politicize the legal system whether the Gestapo won or lost. The second message that the Gestapo sent, which illustrated the workings of the dual state, was that the Gestapo would decide what was politically necessary, not a court. Forget about the notion that the court could slice it and dice it, declaring that the Gestapo could accomplish its political goals and could still adhere to the association's prior contractual obligations to terminated employees. The Gestapo would decide for itself how to accomplish its political goals. The Gestapo's decision in the Delatovsky case was that its former ideological opponents would not reap any financial benefit from a previous Weimar era contractual right. And the third message that the Gestapo sent about the workings of the dual state occurred when its lawyer argued that the Nazi state could even dissolve a marriage and declare it void. The message there was that the Nazi state could reshape any legal relationship, not only a collective bargaining agreement, a relatively recent form of contract, basically a Weimar era innovation, but also a marriage, one of the most traditional forms of contract, a deeply embedded social practice. In claiming such sweeping control over marriage, the Gestapo lawyer implied 
that the Nazi state could assert the authority to reshape almost any legal relationships, not only legal contracts, but also social custom. The Nazi state reserved the power to dominate even the most private and intimate relationships. Therefore, the Nazi dual state would politicize whatever it saw fit. It would use its power to enforce its new politics, and it would destroy the remnants from Weimar and from much earlier times too. The Nazi dual state's politicization of society as a whole was illustrated in its Gleitschaltung, its Nazification of a cremation society. In the late 1930s, while still in Nazi Germany, Frankel wrote his classic book titled The Dual State. And he expressed his theory in terms of what he called in English, the prerogative state and the normative state. The prerogative state was the realm of arbitrary power and official violence, of intimidating violence, against which citizens enjoyed no legal protection. The normative state was not the rule of law, rather it was the legal order, including traditional law and newly enacted Nazi law. The dual state consisted of a dynamic interplay between the prerogative state and the normative state, with arbitrary power of the prerogative state leading the way and the Nazifying legal system of the normative state playing catch up. The prerogative state reshaped the normative state in its image, transforming the whole legal political system. In the Delatovsky case, the prerogative state embodied in the Gestapo defeated and taught a lesson to the normative state embodied in the courts. And let me add this detail, the Gestapo in the Delatovsky case, had invoked the normative state in the form of Nazi laws. The Gestapo lawyer had argued in part based on laws allowing the confiscation of property of communists and other so-called enemies of the state. These laws were based on the origins of the prerogative state itself. That is on the Reichstag fire emergency decree of February 28, 1933 based the day before the Reichstag fire, when Germany's Reichstag, its parliament building burned, providing the pretext the following day for an emergency decree titled for the protection of people and the state. In his book, Frankel aptly described that decree as in actuality, the constitutional charter of the Third Reich. The decree purported to protect Germany against communist violence. It indefinitely suspended civil liberties guaranteed in the Weimar Constitution. It empowered the national government to intervene to restore order whenever and wherever necessary. And it transformed Nazi rule into a permanent dictatorship with unlimited power, with unlimited arbitrary political power. The Reichstag fire emergency decree set in motion the establishment of a regime consisting of the prerogative state and the normative state. The Nazis had created a dual state in an abrupt transition to Nazi rule from the Weimar Republic's constitution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Morris. Uh, lots of food for thought there. And I'm, I'm not sure if any of the questions are very specific to what you were just presenting to us, but perhaps we'll take one from Jeff uh, Daub. Um, to what extent, if any, did the Treaty of Versailles serve as a predicate, as is often claimed for the Weimar Republic's ultimate collapse? Would a somewhat less progressive constitution have provided the tools needed to prevent the Nazis' rise to power? Well, I mean, I, I agree with uh, Ben on that one, that uh, social forces are stronger than uh, legal forces. Um, and the uh, Treaty of Versailles continued to be a uh, hot uh, political point, which uh, during the Weimar Republic, uh, all parties were concerned about the right wing mo more vociferously, uh, but even the social Democrats 
um, did, did not have sympathy for the uh, Treaty of Versailles. And, and it was certainly one among many other symbols that the uh, Nazis uh, harked back on and kept on uh, referring to into and throughout the Nazi era. Right, thank you. Maybe one follow-up uh, question from Jason Cherniak. Did the Weimar Republic have any laws that formally limited the powers of the executive? Was the prerogative state ignoring such laws or taking advantage of a void? Well, in, in, to pick up on the notion of the prerogative state of the, the uh, Nazi regime, uh, what, it, what first of all, the prerogative state, as Frankel uh, saw it, was the uh, uh, realm of political power which was not controlled by law. Uh, but I think that one of the points that uh, Frankel made um, uh, quite persuasively and sometimes is missed is that that prerogative state uh, really reshaped the normative state. It took into its hands uh, the uh, existing frameworks and it restructured them uh, for its own purposes. It restructured them, for example, by creating uh, special courts, uh, most famously the People's Court, uh, but it also reframed the interpretation of laws and the uses of laws, and it put judges under pressures uh, to uh, interpret laws in a Nazified way. Uh, so that when Ben earlier referred, for example, to positive law uh, during the Weimar Republic, um, and one of the uh, apologies and excuses that later uh, Nazi era judges and even lawyers used to justify their horrible actions was that they had no choice under the law. That's a totally uh, wrong interpretation because in, for, in fact, they did have a choice. They did interpret the laws. Uh, they interpreted the laws in a way which favored the Nazis. Uh, they turned towards also the new laws that the Nazis created um, and they uh, interpret all the laws, the old laws and the new laws in terms of a Nazified legal doctrine um, which, uh, which pointed to a Führer's state, a leadership state in which they were trying to uh, promote the uh, values of uh, Nazi ideology and to follow the lead of Adolf Hitler. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Morris, for, for that perspective. And our next speaker is Herr Linda Power Studer, Professor of Philosophy and Ethics at the University of Vienna. In her recently published work, Justifying Injustice, Legal Theory in Nazi Germany, Professor Power Studer explores the background for the collapse of the Weimar Republic and pays particular attention to the shortcomings in the Weimar Constitution and whether the president's powers contradicted the spirit of the democratic Weimar Constitution. Today, her talk is entitled, A Tale of Distorted Legality and of Illegitimacy, The Transition from the Weimar Republic to the Third Reich. Professor Power Studer, we look forward to hearing from you. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I would like to thank the organizers of this event. And I also feel very honored to be able to speak here. Now, the Nazi seizure of power was a radical break with the preceding political order. It set an end to Germany's first democracy. However, the Nazis could rely upon authoritarian practices of governance that characterized the final period of the Weimar Republic. And the fall of Weimar was also due to certain shortcomings in the constitution, such as governance by presidential emergency decrees. I think the point has been mentioned already, but also the absence of a constitutional court with clear competencies for judicial review. Now, from the beginning, the Weimar constitution was not received with broad approval, let alone enthusiasm. It was a document of political compromise. In a 1919 speech, Hugo Preuss, he was entrusted in November 1918 to draft with other experts a new constitution. He said the following, I quote here Hugo Preuss, he said, the German constitution came about in the shadow of a terrible defeat. It did not come easily to the people, but entered history in arduous negotiations. The constitution rests on an alliance 
of Democrats, Social Democrats and centrists. And these very different parties will have to continue to work together. Now, I think this passage reveals the fragility of the constitutional basis of the new state. A constitution's normative authority, its value, should hold independently of the political powers involved in its emergence. And the constitution should be, of course, above party politics. Price's statement is significant, I think, for the Weimar Constitution's fate. It never became a stronghold for governing and guiding political life in Germany between 1919 and 1932. Now, why did the spirit of the Weimar Constitution not come to life? An, answer, uh, an easy answer is, of course, there were not enough Democrats around. However, historians and critical observers cite also the lack of positive engagement on behalf of the political parties and the Reichstag representatives, the opposition including. According to this objection, they simply had no sense of their responsibility for a positive and constructive political culture. However, there was also an article in the Constitution itself that played a key role in Weimar's demise, Article 48. And I think it has been already mentioned uh, before by Professor Carter Head. This Article 48, the so-called dictatorship article, allowed the Reich president to intervene in the political process via emergency decree. Article 48, Section 2, defined the measures the Reich president might take to restore public order and security should they be disturbed or in danger. And in addition to the right to call upon the assistance of the armed forces, the president could abrogate articles of the constitution that guaranteed the protection of basic civil rights and liberties. And we can of course ask, how did an article granting the president such extensive executive powers find its way into the constitution of a parliamentary democracy at all? Now, given the politically unstable situation, the constitution drafters aim to protect the new republic against the potentially destructive forces of the extreme right and the radical left. It was particularly Max Weber, the famous sociologist, uh, he was a member of the committee for drafting the constitution. Weber pleaded for establishing the right president as a, a strong counterweight to the parliament. Now, given the still widespread endorsement of a hierarchical state, a so-called Ubekeitstaat in Germany, the constitution's guarantee of extensive presidential powers lend itself to the rise of authoritarianism. Now, uh, uh, one has to say here that also Article 48 was made use of by Friedrich Ebert, the first president, but as long as Friedrich Ebert was president, this accumulation of power did not seriously threaten democracy. And also Paul von Hindenburg, he was also mentioned already, who became president after Ebert's death in 1925, he kept strictly to the terms of the office in the first years. But all this changed remarkably in October 1929, and I think Professor Berman outlined uh, uh, the reasons and the uh, uh, economic and political crisis. Uh, a period of political instability set in, and for example, Heinrich Brüning's minority government relied more on Hindenburg's emergency decrees than on legislation by the Reichstag. And Brüning resigned on May 30, 1932, followed by Franz von Papen. He was also already mentioned. Now, the last month of the Weimar Republic began with an unprecedented attack on the elected Prussian state government. Prussia was the largest federal state. 
Reichskanzler Franz von Papen dismissed in on July 20, 1932, the elected Prussian government and placed Prussia under the authority of a federal commissioner. And the legal basis for Papen's spectacular attack on Prussia was exactly an emergency decree signed by Reich President Hindenburg. Uh, uh, Prussia was uh, uh, accused that it ha had failed to maintain public security and order during violent clashes between Nazis, communists and the police in various Prussian cities, including Berlin. Ironically, This unrest was spurred on by a measure passed by Papen's own government. Eager to make concessions to the rising Nazi party, Papen had revoked the prohibition on the Nazi stormtroopers, the SA, a very powerful paramilitary organization in June 1932. Now, what did the Prussian government do? They went the uh, way of the rule of law and brought the issue to the state court in Leipzig. Uh, and the state court in Leipzig uh, decided end of October 1932 that the Prussian government had not violated its duties towards the Reich, yet had failed to guarantee public security and order. So no violation of the sec first section of this Article 48, but a violation of Article 48.2. And the court perceived this divided judgment as a chance for, a, for compromise, but this was illusionary in light of the political circumstances. Now, the crucial question, namely whether Hindenburg's use of Article 48 in this case Uh, was in line with the Constitution, was not addressed by the uh, court. And there were two reasons for this. One reason was that the Leipzig State Court was not a constitutional court with full judicial review competences. The other reason was that prominent legal theorists, foremost Karl Schmidt, argued that the Reich President himself was, and this was men already mentioned also, that the Reich President himself was the guardian of the Constitution and therefore not subject to judicial review. And this, the absence of a full Supreme Court or Constitutional Court was certainly a major defect in the Weimar Constitution. There was simply no legal body that could assess whether state institutions, including the Reich President, were acting in conformity with the Weimar Constitution or not. Now, by the time Hitler assumed office, the National Socialists knew perfectly well what a powerful tool the emergency decrees provided, and they were determined to use them. Now, the first decisive legal measure was Uh, uh, the uh, Reichstag Fire Decree from February 28, 1933. It suspended basically civil liberties such as freedom of expression, right to assembly, and also intervened extensively into the private sphere. And the second legal measure paving the way for dictatorship was the Enabling Act of March 24, 1933. The Enabling Act authorized the government to enact laws and amend the Constitution without parliamentary oversight or consent. And the Enabling Act served as a basis for a number of so-called coordination measures, Gleichschaltungsmaßnahmen, for then establishing a totalitarian state. Now, in summary, we can say the National Socialists used constitutional norms as the means for exerting the kind of power that was illegal by those very constitutional standards. And political manipulation and propaganda did the rest. So the process by which the National Socialists take over unfolded, necessitated in the, also from the standpoint of the Nazis, a dual justification. Politically, it was important to depict the transition from Weimar to the Third Reich as a radical revolutionary 
break. This was owed to the political movement. However, from a normative perspective, it was crucial to defend the legality of the process. So in his 1939 study on the constitutional foundations of the Third Reich, Ernst Rudolf Huber, a pupil of Carl Schmidt, wrote that, quote, then Reich President von Hindenburg placed the leadership of the Reich's government into the hands of Adolf Hitler, and when the people affirmed this decision by a majority, the Weimar Constitution was dead. For Hoover, the NS state, the National Socialist state, rested on new constitutional foundations, and he quoted the Enabling Act and the law for the reconstruction of the Reich of January 30, 1934, which eliminated the authority of the federal states. Now, the problem with this definition of the National Socialist States Constitution was that both the Enabling Act as well as the law for the reconstruction of the Reich only became law through the application of Article 76 of the Weimar Constitution. Huber was thus obliged to accept that both measures derived from the very Constitution which he himself had declared dead by the time those laws came into force. Now, how did a legal theorist like Huber, schooled in constitutional law, cope with this obvious inconsistency? So for Huber, the decisive factor for the normative validity of legal principles was not their formal legality, but their legitimacy. And by legitimacy, he meant their congruence with the principles of the National Socialist political movement and the Nazi worldview. Huber wrote, I quote him here, from mere legality, we must distinguish legitimacy as the innermost justification of a political or constitutional act. The legitimacy of the laws of March 24, 1933, in January 30, 1934, does not derive from the Weimar Constitution, but from the National Socialist Revolution. And he added, those who conclude that the Weimar Constitution is still valid remain back to the framework of a failed legal formalism, of constitutional positivism and normativism. So to be clear, Whereas in a democracy, we tie the concept of legitimacy to the rule of law and to human rights and the protection of civil rights, he tied legitimacy to the National Socialist political movement. So to summarize my talk, the Nazi legal theorists sought to reconcile the tension between revolutionary political momentum and legal conformity by characterizing Hitler's political coup as, as they called it, a legal revolution. They insisted on the legality of the Nazis' power grab by pointing to its continuity with government by emergency, sorry, by emergency decrees in the Weimar Republic. According to this argument, Hitler's measures were no different from how late Weimar era governments relied on Hindenburg's invocation of Article 48. However, what the Nazi legal theorists ignored were the strikingly different political ends to which appeals to Article 48 in the Weimar era and in the Nazi era strived, namely saving a democratic system versus destroying democracy completely. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Power Studer, for that uh, very um, enlightening uh, presentation to us. And I think all of your presentations have addressed a lot of the, the really interesting questions in the Q&A. Um, but in, and in the interest of time, I think I'm just going to 
to end with one that I would like you all and your kind of takeaway remarks, um, your quick takeaway remarks for our final round to a address and then just perhaps respond to what you heard from each other and maybe the linkages which I find are many. You've approached the issue from uh, different angles, but um, I think arrived at some of the same conclusions. So we have a, a comment and question from uh, Kay Sachs, who is the spouse of a deceased Holocaust survivor, who writes that in the 80 years since the end of World War II, the world seems to have learned nothing and forgotten everything. Ongoing education to both the current leaders of the world and the future leaders of the world is essential. How can we educate them to accept that there are better ways to solve the world's problems uh, than war? We fight the war, but uh, fight the war with words, not with bullets. So uh, I think it's a, something very nice to uh, to respond to. I just like to say to her also, this is this is the very reason for our Holocaust uh, program at the United Nations. It is really to keep um, the truth, the facts uh, um, alive and the history alive. Um, but I'd love to ask our remaining panelists, um, I, just to note that uh, Professor Berman had to leave, but we'll go in, um, in the order, perhaps, uh, maybe we'll go in the reverse order since you've already been on the screen. <laughs> Um, uh, Dr. Power Studer, would you like to start? And then we'll go to Dr. Morris for final uh, concluding remarks and then Professor Head. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, about the question whether the learn world has learned anything or whether the world has not learned anything from the events in the Nazi era, it's hard to decide. I just have the hope that the world will listen and we'll look back to history, and it was mentioned already, right? If we don't learn from history, history, sadly enough, will repeat itself. So it's my hope that my country, Austria, has learned its lesson, and I hope also the world can learn from uh, uh, looking back at the Nazi events and era. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And um, I'd like to see if Douglas Morris has some concluding remarks. Thank you. Uh, I think that one of the uh, themes that runs through um, what I find interesting in studying the Weimar Republic and uh, the Nazi era and its aftermath is what's the nature of the rule of law? Uh, what is the rule of law? And uh, part of understanding what the rule of law is, seeing how it is attacked. I think that the uh, issue of the rule of law, that term is used more often than it's defined, uh, but it uh, is a, a term as I understand it and as uh, defined by Ernst Frankel and uh, Franz Neumann, one of his uh, uh, partners and, and contemporary intellectuals, uh, as an idea of uh, uh, equality under the law of neutral decision making um, and of using uh, reason uh, in order to uh, 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 resolve disputes. Uh, and I think that that uh, concept needs uh, more elaboration. It needs to be referred to more often with more specificity uh, and uh, be brought to bear to uh, various situations. Um, I think that by doing that, uh, it uh, might then help to cast more light on uh, what can we learn from the Nazi era or, or other eras and uh, other circumstances and how uh, can uh, what I think is an ideal of the rule of law, whether it uh, uh, is effectuated uh, perfectly, which obviously it isn't, but as a guide uh, for evaluating a series of actions. And uh, I think that would then contribute to ongoing uh, discussions uh, and debates and uh, keeping them vibrant and helping more and more people to think in, in those terms. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Morris. I appreciate the, those words. And and Professor Het, would you like to, last but not least, give your sure. concluding observations? Sure. Thank you. So you know, I think that um, actually there were quite common themes running through all the papers, and I might put it this way: you know, the theme I see really is that the rule of law doesn't happen by itself. It doesn't happen without us as citizens 
being in the process. Um, and I wouldn't be a professor if I didn't feel that it was important to try to bring that lesson to young people. It's not always going to take, but you do what you can, you know. And I want to just actually close with something. When I um, when I was writing my book on Hans Litten, I had the privilege of interviewing his niece, uh, a remarkable lady who lives in Nuremberg, I've uh, become friends with uh, Patricia Litten. And Patricia told me something I thought quite wise. She said, it's important to reflect upon history and uh, it's important to be humble and not to think that we would not make the same mistakes as people in the past were we in their situation. And so um, I think, you know, in a sense, humility is an important part of the historical lesson. Perhaps wise humility. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, great. Thank you very much. And, and we have come to the end of our, our panel discussion, our conversation today. I think we're all much enlightened. And I'd like to thank our speakers, Professor Berman, Professor Het, Dr. Morris, Professor Power Studer, for your really insightful presentations. Um, you have certainly enriched our knowledge and understanding of the period preceding the Holocaust and it helped us to consider again how relevant this history remains almost a century later. Thank you for making the time to be with us today. And a big thank you to all of those who are watching to your questions. I'm really sorry we didn't get to all of them, um, but I hope that in uh, that the um, papers and the, the talks that were presented actually did answer a lot of those questions because they were absolutely you know, full of substance and, and content. Um, to our attendees, uh, we would very much appreciate it if you would complete a survey. It's in the link. You'll to find it displayed now on the Q&A session. We're really keen to see to get your feedback and uh, you will receive also uh, following the event an email with the links, uh, including the one for this survey. Links to this, um, for those of you who may have missed it, uh, to this event, but also to the survey. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe and all the best. <laughs>